If the Sacramento Kings are going to make any more major improvements this offseason, it's likely going to be through the trade market. And with the rumors surrounding Kevin Durant and Donovan Mitchell, should the Sacramento Kings pursue being the third team in one of those blockbuster deals? We'll talk about that. Plus, of course, Keegan Murray shines again right here on the Locked on Kings podcast. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome to Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all regular season and all off season. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports producer and reporter at ABC 10 News, hence the mic flag if you're watching here on YouTube. Audio listeners, appreciate you as well. Very excited for today's episode of Locked On Kings. I for sure could spend the majority of this episode praising Keegan Murray like I've been doing on almost every episode since Summer League began. And don't worry, I'll definitely get some Keegan Murray praise with the game that he get, had, really the three quarters that he had against the Phoenix Suns. We'll talk about that in the next segment. But the Sacramento Kings, they still have an offseason to complete. And while I do think they've drastically improved this roster, especially with just drafting Keegan Murray, there still are questions about how much better is this team, right? With the Western Conference expected to be better with the exception of the Utah Jazz who are likely going to plummet if they do trade uh, Donovan Mitchell. Also, the San Antonio Spurs likely plummeting as well. Where do the Sacramento Kings work their way into the actual playoff picture? How much of a jump should we realistically expect them to make based off of the moves that they've made this offseason? Definitely the Kings are trending in the right direction, but so are a lot of other teams in the Western Conference. So I think we all agree that if the Sacramento Kings have opportunities to continue to improve this roster this offseason, they should definitely go for those opportunities. And Monty McNair, he's been very open. Uh, he spoke recently, basically said that... Uh, he, he doesn't think the team is done or that they're going to continue to keep their options open. He's been consistent in his through uh, just his entire time uh, as the general manager of the Sacramento Kings. He's been consistent saying we're going to keep our options open. We're going to remain flexible. If we can pull off a move, if it becomes available that helps the Sacramento Kings and makes sense, we're going to go for that move. And maybe that's where being the third team in a blockbuster trade makes a lot of sense. Look, as much as we would love for Kevin Durant to become a Sacramento King, as much as I would love Donovan Mitchell to become a Sacramento King, a big fan of his. The likelihood of the Kings being the team to make that move. The, the, it just making sense for the Kings to be that team. It, it doesn't make sense is what I'm trying to say. As much as they would like to land Kevin Durant, as much as Donovan Mitchell, both of those players would improve the Sacramento Kings roster, it would likely take such a significant haul to get either one of those players that it completely goes against the, uh, the plan that Monty McNair and the Kings have been trying to execute really since trading Tyrese Halliburton at last year's trade deadline. So... The Kings likely won't be the main trade partner for either the Brooklyn Nets or Utah Jazz, but... When blockbuster trades happen, especially when big uh, money contracts are being moved, every once in a while, a third team is needed to help balance things out. The Sacramento Kings, I think, should not only be in a are, are not only a good team to put themselves in that third team position. I think they should be aggressively trying to be that team. Should be calling the Nets. Should be calling the Jazz, saying, "Hey, whatever deal you're trying to work out with these other teams, we'll be a part of it. We'll help either take salary off your hands, take salary off of other teams to make this trade happen for you." And the Sacramento Kings, likely depending upon the trades would also potentially have to include their own draft capital in order to add the quality of player that they want or to help the deal go through. Let you, you see the rumors and the conversations built around trading Kevin Durant, built around trading Donovan Mitchell, and the amount of draft picks involved are insane, right? And that was really the fault of kind of the Utah Jazz, but mainly the Minnesota Timberwolves, who traded five first-round draft picks to get Rudy Gobert. So if Rudy Gobert can command that much draft capital, how much can Kevin Durant, arguably one of the greatest players of all time, how much does he get? Donovan Mitchell, how much does he get? You, would ar you could argue that Donovan Mitchell was the better player than Rudy Gobert and the star of the Utah Jazz team, although some people might put that on Rudy Gobert. If that much draft capital is required to acquire one of these players, it's no wonder that 
other teams are hesitant to completely pull the trigger on that. Could the Sacramento Kings lighten some of that load and say, hey, okay, you want six first-round picks for Donovan Mitchell? We will include a pick of ours to make your count now down to five if you give us this in return. So I started having fun on the NBA trade machines, and I know the NBA trade machine can be both a blessing for content and an absolute you-know-what fest, right? The trade machine, it's fun for us all to play GM. I love playing armchair GM. I love my GM mode in NBA 2K, right? So I'm going based off of my understanding of what the Sacramento Kings would want, what the other two teams in these trades would want. And also I used research and and stuff like that to kind of get an understanding of which pieces they'd be willing to move on from and which they wouldn't, right? There are some teams, for example, like the Toronto Raptors. They've made it known that if they were to acquire, uh, acquire Kevin Durant, and they've been very interested in acquiring Kevin Durant, they would not want to trade Scotty Barnes in that deal. So for the trade that I put together, I did not include Scotty Barnes. And in fact, let's start there. We're going to start with a couple of Kevin Durant trades, then we'll go to a couple of Donovan Mitchell trades for this exercise. And also, if you have any major trades this offseason that you want to include the Kings as the third team in, why don't you send those to me? You can send those on Twitter, at MattGeorgeSack. Email them to me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Or if you uh, want to type them out on YouTube in the comment section, uh, please do that. But we'll start with the Toronto Raptors trade. And again, these are based off of my understanding of what all teams want, there might be Brooklyn Nets fans or Toronto Raptors fans that come into the chat and tell me our team would never do that. That's totally fine. I'm going off of the context that I have here from Sacramento. Also, these are just the players that would be moved in the deal. Obviously, there'd be a bunch of picks involved as well. I'm not going to talk about the picks because that wastes too much time. I'm just going to talk about the players. So here is the Toronto Raptors deal to land Kevin Durant that I came up with. Toronto gets Kevin Durant and Rashawn Holmes. The Brooklyn Nets get Pascal Siakam, Gary Trent Jr., and Terrence Davis, and the Sacramento Kings get OG Ananobi. I know OG has been a player that a lot of people, at least on Kings Twitter, have wanted the Sacramento Kings to go out and get. He is a wing, a natural small forward. He definitely comes in, and immediately you're okay with either trading away Harrison Barnes, who I did not have to move in this deal. Maybe I would have to trade Harrison Barnes away to make this deal happen. You're okay with Harrison walking at the end of the year if he sticks around. Or maybe you move Harrison Barnes at the trade deadline. OG Ananobi immediately becomes your starting three. Now, if I'm the Brooklyn Nets, I'm probably, if OG's being moved in this trade, I'm trying to make sure that I get him, right? Not the Sacramento Kings. This is where picks would come into play, right? I think if the Sacramento Kings want to pull this trade off, they might have to give up multiple first rounders. Are you okay with that? I would definitely think about it. I'm definitely giving up one in this deal. Saying goodbye to Rashawn Holmes and Terrence Davis had to be done really for uh, for contract purposes and, and salary purposes to bring in uh, OG's $17.3 million that he's owed next year. But I think that would be, that's an example of how the Kings could work their way into a deal, apply the salary, acquire or put in the salary needed to make the deal work, work also include draft picks to sweeten up the pot either for Brooklyn more than likely for Brooklyn and still come out of it with a damn good player that sets themselves up for the future. So that's the Toronto Raptors uh, trade that I came up with. And by the way, I read recently that the Raptors are, are kind of slipping or, or losing interest in the KD deal or it's becoming less likely that Toronto can offer what KD uh, is worth and what the Brooklyn Nets are asking for, especially if they're not willing to move on from Scotty Barnes. Here's the big team that we've heard KD connected to. That's the Miami Heat. The Heat get Kevin Durant and Terrence Davis. The Brooklyn Nets get Rashawn Holmes, Bam, (coughs) excuse me, Rashawn Holmes, Bam Adebayo, and Tyler Hero, in addition to, of course, multiple picks. The Sacramento Kings take Duncan Robinson. Robinson is someone that I talked about recently who potentially the Kings could be interested in acquiring in a Harrison Barnes deal. The Miami Heat reportedly, or at least have been rumored to have interest in Harrison Barnes, especially if they're not able to land Kevin Durant. Looking at this Heat roster, there is really no one realistically that I could see the Sacramento Kings being interested in taking in this deal that improves their roster that the Miami Heat or the Brooklyn Nets would be willing to give up in this deal other than Duncan Robinson. Robinson comes in, he's on a good contract, he's a great shooter. He fits offensively, at least, makes a lot of sense, next to De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis. And, 
again, you still have Harrison Barnes on your roster, theoretically, in this deal. Harrison continues to be your starting three. Duncan Robinson backs him up. We'll see how well Duncan does. There's questions about him defensively, of course. But maybe Duncan Robinson, you end up being okay with taking over that starting three spot if you want to move HB at the trade deadline or lose him in free agency next offseason for nothing. But that was the way that I could see, realistically, the Kings getting involved in the Miami Heat deal. Now, in this deal specifically, I wouldn't give up multiple firsts for Sacramento. I'd include one first maybe to get that deal done and maybe would ask for future draft compensation, whether it's multiple second rounders or another future first that has less value that's heavily protected. If you're only getting Duncan Robinson and the worst you're giving up is Terrence Davis, I think I also gave up Rashawn Holmes in this deal, if I'm not mistaken. Let me look back at it. Uh, Yes, I did give up Rashawn Holmes. So I'm giving up Rashawn. I'm giving up Terrence Davis. I'm taking back Duncan Robinson. Maybe I don't need to include a pick, but more than likely the Miami Heat would ask Sacramento to include a pick in this deal in order to help facilitate and get the deal done. The last Kevin Durant trade. Actually, I think I have two more. Do I have two more Kevin Durant trades? No, I have the last Kevin Durant trade that I put together is with the Golden State Warriors. Now, I would hate this scenario, right? I would hate KD going back to Golden State and making them just ridiculously good again. But I have the Warriors landing Kevin Durant and Terrence Davis. The Brooklyn Nets getting Andrew Wiggins, Jordan Poole, Jonathan Kaminga. I was thinking about adding Wiseman, but I'm not sure any Warriors fans in there want to tell me if Wiseman would be available in this deal or not, if they would ask for him or not. They more than likely would. And a draft pick as well, or multiple draft picks as well. And the Sacramento Kings in this deal get Moses Moody. Now, Moody's more of a shooting guard than a small forward. The Kings have bulked up on shooting guards with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter. But Moses Moody is a really, really good young player, a player that I definitely would be interested in having on the Sacramento Kings. And I don't know if you're comfortable giving him looks as a backup small forward. If you're comfortable maybe with Kevin Herter playing that spot, I think Moses Moody could potentially play that spot for you as well. Plus, he's on an extremely affordable deal. I think he's under contract for the next three years. uh, So you have time to figure that out. Likely, the Kings would, again, have to include a draft pick in this deal. Maybe it's a far future draft pick, heavily protected, that makes it worth giving up Rashawn Holmes and Terrence Davis, worth giving up that pick and taking back a player like Moses Moody, who's not nearly the best player in this draft. The best players from the, the, the Warriors are going to the Brooklyn Nets in this deal, and rightfully so. So those are the trades that I put together for Kevin Durant. Now, I put together two trades for Donovan Mitchell. Trading Donovan Mitchell is very interesting, especially with the New York Knicks. Like the New York Knicks, both of these deals that I put together are with New York, who is theoretically or reportedly pretty, I don't know if desperate is the right word. Maybe desperate is correct. They're they're very interested in landing Donovan Mitchell, right? But to make this Donovan Mitchell trade work, the Nets have to get rid of a lot of salary. And I intentionally did not include Julius Randle in both these deals because I don't know I don't believe the Brooklyn Nets or the Sacramento Kings would be interested in taking Julius Randle and his contract at this point. The Kings, at this point, don't really need to. Maybe they consider it. I think they consider it more than the Brooklyn Nets do. But in both of these deals, Julius Randle is not involved. At least that's how I think it would go. I could be wrong. Again, let me know if you think I'm wrong. But in this deal, the New York, this first one, New York Knicks get Donovan Mitchell, nobody else. The Utah Jazz, ready for this? They get Harrison Barnes, Evan Fournier, Terrence Davis, Quentin Grimes, Obi Toppin, Emmanuel Quickly, and Miles McBride. Now, McBride, Quickly, Toppin, and Grimes were reportedly what the Utah Jazz initially asked for in addition to, I believe, six first-round picks, and the Knicks weren't too happy with that trade. If you include just those four players and picks, it's not enough money for Donovan Mitchell. They needed to free up more money. So here's how the Sacramento Kings worked their way into things. The Kings obviously included Harrison Barnes in this deal, like I mentioned. They get back two players, Boyan Bogdanovich, and Cam Reddish. So you have to give up Harrison Barnes, who you're losing at the end of the year. Now, Cam Reddish and Boyan Bogdanovich are also expiring contracts. So you trade one expiring for two expirings. Boyan can immediately step in and be be your starting three if you want, and that's a position that he played with success a lot in Utah and before in Indiana. Cam Reddish, younger, kind of a little more of a product, but has significant upside. Maybe he's someone that you're comfortable with developing, have him come off the bench as that backup three, see how well he does. If he does good, you re-sign him this offseason. He's your starting three going forward. I'm a little less interested in this deal. This was the only way that I could see the Kings working themselves into a a third-team trade, and they pick up assets, but not not as significant, maybe, as I would want. So there's the that's the first trade. The second one is very similar to the first one, except 
instead of the uh, the Kings, or rather, instead of the Jazz trading, or rather, landing um, Evan Fournier, they instead take back Derrick Rose. Maybe this one is a little more realistic, but the Jazz, would, in this case, would get Rose, Barnes, Davis, Grimes, Toppin, Quickly, McBride. Mitchell goes to the Knicks, and Sacramento gets, once again, Boyan Bogdanovich and Cam Reddish. I like my potential KD trades more than I like the Donovan Mitchell trades, especially if Mitchell is going to go to the Utah Jazz and they seem like the most likely team, um, excuse me, especially if Mitchell is going to go to the New York Knicks and he seems like the most likely team for, for him to end up at this point in time. But if you have other trades, if you like any of them, hate any of those ones that I put out there, the point is there's value to be picked up that Sacramento could potentially work their way into. And I think Monty McNair, if nothing else, should be monitoring what's going on, aggressively involved in calls. And if it makes sense, maybe, just maybe, he'll pull the trigger on it. But let me know what you think about those deals. Let me know any deals that you might have. Also, the Kings did make some moves. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the couple of signings that they made today. Uh, And coming up next, we're talking about the great game that Keegan Murray had and the Kings win over the Phoenix Suns in Summer League. Before we get to that, I want to tell you about a couple of, or actually one of our two great sponsors of the Locked on Kings podcast today. That is Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes, and models of vehicles, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to carry all the parts that you need. Why would you sit through uh, sometimes intimidating, uh, boring, frustrating questioning only to be priced in at the parts that that dealership or that chain store may or may not even have? And if they do have them, they're at their set price points, their set brands. You have no negotiation power whatsoever and no access to the savings unless you have access to the internet through your phone, your tablet, your computer at home. RockAuto.com means 30, 50, or even 100% more savings for the same exact parts that you would get at your local chain auto parts store. RockAuto.com is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for every single customer. They have everything you could need, like brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. You can go and explore their easy-to-use website today and find the solution to your auto parts needs. And when you go to RockAuto.com, make sure you like uh, make sure you write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you amazing selection reliably low prices all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com tell me if you've heard this before here on the locked on kings podcast over the last couple of weeks but keegan murray is phenomenal i mean what more do i have to say keegan murray is just so damn good he continues to be so damn good somehow even though he scored now 20 points in Six of the seven summer league games that he's played, he continues to surprise you and impress you with with how he scores. In this game, it was showing off a little more of the range that he has, his quick release from three. Just, boy, Keegan Murray is something else. Like, yeah, you're damn right. I'm going to pat myself on the back for liking Keegan Murray from the very beginning. But again, in full transparency, I did not expect this Keegan Murray. I did not expect Keegan to be this good. Also, round of applause to Keegan for playing seven Summer League games, including the three California Classic games, that's absolutely nuts. Paolo Bancaro was shut down after two. Jaden Ivey played only one in a little bit. That's not his fault. He got a little bit hurt, and they aired on the side of caution. The Detroit Pistons did. Uh, I know uh, sh- who played only – who didn't even play a single game. I can't remember. There's a, there's a player that didn't even uh, – top six pick or something that didn't even play a single game uh, in Summer League so far. I do give credit to Chet Holmgren. He's played every single game so far. Did he play tonight? I'm actually not sure if he played tonight or not. But regardless, nobody can hold a candle to what Keegan Murray has done in free agency, uh, <laughs> rather in Summer League. and. As excited as I am to watch Keegan play, as happy as I am to watch Keegan play, I'm now really at the point of like, okay, Keegan, we've seen it. Like, we know you're the guy. We know you're really, really good. You, you don't have anything more to prove. But what's funny is when I put out on Twitter that uh, he'd played seven games, his dad actually responded to me on Twitter and told me that Keegan's just happy to play basketball. He's just excited to play. He hadn't played for a couple of months, and he's happy to be out there. I love that. Trust me, I love that. But at some point, you also kind of have to protect the player from themselves, right? Because I believe Keegan Murray is the competitor that's going to want to play in every single game that he's capable of playing in, right? A good example is Donovan, or dang it, Davion Mitchell. Davion Mitchell here in Sacramento, he played a lot of games, and he worked 
really, really hard in practice. He was the first one to the gym and last one to leave, and he kind of burnt himself out a little bit. The Sacramento Kings actually had to hold him back a little bit and say, hey, man, take some time off. He was always working during his rare off days that he had. Take a break. It's a long season. It's a marathon, not a sprint. The Kings had to kind of protect Davion from himself a little bit. The Sacramento Kings might have to do the same thing with Keegan Murray because we have seen he's a workhorse. We've seen he's a competitor. He clearly wants to play. Now, the Sacramento Kings have one more scheduled game. I believe it's their last one on Saturday against the Houston Rockets, if I'm not mistaken. So tomorrow against the Houston Rockets, the Kings will play one more game. I guess I'd be happy if Keegan Murray plays, but if the Sacramento Kings decide to shut him down like they did the entire fourth quarter in this game, again, I'm all for that too. And Keegan Murray scored 21 points and had 10 rebounds, his first double-double of Summer League, and he did it in three quarters. Like in a, in a grand total, I think 23 minutes played. Yep, 22 minutes, 56 seconds. Keegan had a 21 and 10 stat line. He also uh, added an assist to that stat line uh, and one block shot as well. He was a plus 21 on the game, if you care about plus minus. He showed off the range with the deep three. He absolutely went nuclear in the third quarter. Had 10 points, I think, at halftime. He went 4 of 8 from three-point range, 8 of 14 from the field. Once again, very efficient shooting the basketball. Like, I don't I don't know what more I can say about the guy. Like, he just, it, his numbers, watching him, it speaks for itself. Like, and I, I joke on social media, like, I can't wait to see Keegan Murray have his jersey retired by the end of his career in Sacramento. But also, at the same time, like, let Sacramento Kings fans have their fun. Like, I know it's Summer League. You don't need to say yeah, but to everything that Keegan Murray does. Let Kings fans enjoy this. Let Keegan Murray enjoy this. Let the Sacramento Kings organization enjoy this. Because right now, there's not a better player in Summer League. Like, give the man his Summer League MVP now. Stop wasting time. There have been other really good Summer League performers. Nobody can hold a hat to what Keegan Murray has been consistently able to do now in seven games. And I know Summer League MVP only has to do with the actual games played in Vegas, the four games that they've played. Even so, I don't know a player that can that can rival what Keegan has been able to do and do consistently for the Sacramento Kings Summer League team. He's been so damn good to watch. So fun to watch. And I'm very excited about it. Another thing that I'm excited about that I actually discussed today on d and KC uh, on ESPN 1320 here in Sacramento. I think Mike Brown is even more excited than we are. Because Keegan has shown a versatility that can be so valuable to Coach Brown to where, of course, we expect, I think Keegan Murray's going to be a night one starter. I think he deserves to be a night one starter. And when he's on the floor with De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis, we know he's going to play more of a floor, uh, floor spacing support role on offense, and rightfully so. I think you could keep Keegan Murray on the floor with Davion Mitchell in the game and Rashawn Holmes or whoever. And with Fox and Sabonis out, Davion can take some, or sorry, Keegan, Davion as well, but Keegan can take some of that load on himself. If Keegan Murray wants to be the third option right away, I have no problem with that. And if the Kings want to make Keegan the first option to give Fox and Sabonis a rest at the same time, I think they can get away with that this year. Now, that's a lot to ask a rookie to fill in for the gap of both of them. And again, he's going to have guys like Davion and maybe Malik Monk or Kevin Herter, whoever is second in the rotation there, and Trey Lyles maybe to help him, Terrence Davis as well. Like, he's, it's not going to be just him. But what I'm saying is, if you want to rest your two main guys, you can get away with that, resting them at the same time, and still be a good team offensively with Keegan Murray as your focal point on offense. That's going to be a test for him that I hope we get to see this season. And if he accomplishes that goal, especially if opposing defenses start focusing on him as the number one guy when both those guys are out of the game, if he's able to do that, the ceiling's gone up even higher. We're talking about Keegan Murray having uh, the potential to have an all-star career, to be an all-star here in Sacramento, to be a top one or two guy, not just top three, or rather at best third like we think at this point. He's got to prove that. Like, I'm not ready to declare him capable of doing that. We have to see that at the NBA level. But I think his versatility has shown that that is an option. And maybe we didn't think that was that much of an option before this. Not just talking about Nemias, or rather Keegan Murray. I also want to talk about the game that Nemias Keita had. He played 26 minutes, had 15 points, 10 rebounds. I really think that with each passing game, it becomes more likely that Nemias Keita actually earns a full-team contract with the Kings. 
not to start this season. He's on a two-way contract for a reason. I think he's going to get minutes. I think he's going to get opportunity. I think the Myas Keda is going to be what Chemezi Metsu and Damian Jones became for the Sacramento Kings a couple of years ago. I think by next year, we're talking about Keda as a consistent part of the Kings rotation. I really think that. If Rashawn Holmes is still on the roster, then he definitely has someone to compete with. As much as I like Alex Len, I'm picking Nemias Keda over Alex Len at this point in time. That might be recency bias, but I, I really like what Keda brings. Really been impressed with him. Keon Ellis is shooting like 43, 44% from three point range this summer. Like he's playing ridiculously well. If he can carry that consistent three point shooting percentage and his defensive intensity over to the NBA, he'll get good minutes as well, and he might have a chance to earn a full NBA contract. And then I I do want to talk about, really quick, DJ Stewart. Had a really good game. I hope that he's on the Kings G League roster, the Stockton Kings, because he had 14 points. He was not afraid to shoot. Hasn't been all summer long. Went 6 of 17 from the field. 1 of 5 from three-point range, but he was aggressive attacking the basket. Also had five points, a couple of assists. It's good to see that as well. Like, I like a lot of the guys on this Kings Summer League team. There's only so many spots, right? But I really, really like a lot of these guys. I don't know much, though, about the two new guys that the Sacramento Kings signed. I did a little bit of research on one of them, but two guys who have spent time on Mike Brown's Nigerian national team, they are now at least going to be in training camp with the Sacramento Kings. I'll fill you in on that after I fill you in on another great sponsor of the Locked on Kings podcast. I'm talking about Bet Online. I just got back from Vegas. Of course, there's so many great sports books there, so many great ways to bet on sports in Sin City. But nothing that I saw is as good as BetOnline. BetOnline BetOnline.net is the number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. You can find all the latest sports developments, including Major League Baseball happening right now. Hell, you can even bet on Summer League games. You can bet on NBA future bets, fun side bets, including where Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving end up. You can bet on that. And then NFL future bets as well. There's so much fun there. They're your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. They even have your favorite events like MMA, boxing, and even golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action at Ben Online, where the game starts. So the Sacramento Kings made a couple of signings today, both of them familiar to Mike Brown with his time as the head coach of the Nigerian uh, national team. Remember that team that stunned the United States team beat Team USA. I think it was an ex- exhibition game before uh, the Olympics, if I'm not mistaken. But one of those guys is KZ Akpala. He signed a two-year deal with the Sacramento Kings. And I don't, no, I'm not going to pretend to know a lot about this guy. Like, he spent the last three years with the uh, the uh, Miami Heat organization playing for both their main roster uh, and in G League. He is from Stanford, or actually he's from Southern California, if I'm not mistaken, but he played at Stanford. I think he went to high school in Anaheim. Uh, so, uh, played his college career at Stanford. At the NBA level, he hasn't done much. He's not the greatest of shooters, even though I saw some people kind of labeling him as a, a, a three and deep type player. And maybe the Kings are hoping that's what he can become. Mike Brown said in an interview a while ago that he thinks that Casey has the opportunity to become a defensive player of the year, which is really high praise from someone who is as defensive-minded as Mike Brown is. And the Kings signed him to a two-year deal, which makes me think this is more than just a training camp invite. I don't know how many minutes we can expect him to get on the Kings' main roster, if any, consistently this season. But... He seems like a defensive wing, played more time at the four than I think at the three, even though maybe the Kings are looking at him to potentially be a backup three next season. I'm interested to see what he does in preseason, interested to see what he does in training camp. I did watch a little bit of film on him from the game where the the Nigerian team defeated Team USA, and he looked great. Like He was going right at Damian Lillard, who he got the assignment. And that, Again, we're talking like a 6'8 wing guarding a point guard in Damian Lillard and holding his own. Also did a good job switching, spent some time on Kevin Durant, spent some time on Draymond Green. Uh, so it was very interesting to watch that. I liked the intensity that he played with. He moved his feet very, very well. He seemed to communicate well, has a really long uh, wingspan and had a lot of deflections in the uh, the package that I watched. So 
Again, I'm not trying to read too far into things. I don't know that much about the young man. I'm not expecting him to come in and be a world changer, but if he gets opportunity in Sacramento and can take steps towards reaching that ceiling, like Mike Brown talked about, being a defensive player of the year, that's definitely something that the Sacramento Kings team can use. The other, and I don't know the exact correct pronunciation of his name, so I hope I don't butcher it, but Chima Maneke. Also played for the Nigerian national team. Actually a local product. Spent some time at UC Davis. I don't know very much about him whatsoever. Know about even less about him than I do about KZ. But what this says to me is that no, the Sacramento Kings aren't trying to rebuild or remake or basically bring the Nigerian national team to Sacramento. What this says about me is that Monty McNair and Mike Brown are on the same page. Right? This tells me that Brown has input. Brown and, and McNair are working together. Brown is saying, hey, I know these two young men that played for me with, with the Nigerian team. I think they could help us, or at the very least, we should get a look at them. If nothing else, let's bring them into training camp and see what they can provide. And clearly, again, them signing KZ to a two-year deal, they must think that he can be a project that is good to work on for the next couple of years and is not as raw of a project to give him a two-way contract, but actually give him a main roster contract and see what he can turn into, especially defensively. I'm okay with it. I trust McNair. I trust Brown. I'm anxious to see how these two look uh, come training camp. We talked about a lot in today's Locked on Kings podcast. You want to talk about, uh, again, the trades that I put together or any trades that you have where the Kings could be a third team. Want to talk about these two new signings. Want to talk about what the Kings did against the Phoenix Suns. Let me know. At Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Leave your thoughts in the YouTube comment section down below. Really appreciate your support. As always, can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.